This time, let us study the words of God under the title Heavenly Mother and the Most Holy Place. It is written in Matthew chapter 13 that God teaches us all things in parables, isn't it? He says He will utter things hidden since the creation of the world in parables. Through Matthew chapter 13, verse 35, we can understand that God also reveals His will hidden in the holy place and the most holy place of the law of the Old Testament and accomplish His great will. Indeed, there are a number of parables in the Bible. The worship service of the Old Testament and that of the New Testament are very important. God said, worship God in spirit and in truth. The core of worship service in the Old Testament is the sanctuary. Without the sanctuary, no feast could be celebrated. Without the sanctuary, no sacrifice could be dedicated to God. Then, what is hidden in the sanctuary? What is God's will and secret hidden in the sanctuary? From now on, let us find the answer. This is a model of the sanctuary in the Old Testament. In front, there is the altar of burnt offering. You can see the fire rising up. At the back, there is the sanctuary that looks like a tent. And between the sanctuary and the altar, there is the bronze basin. Then, what is the reality of the Old Testament sanctuary? Let's find the answer in the Bible. Let's see the sanctuary again. On the right, you can see the entrance. When you enter through it, there is the table for the bread of the presence. On the opposite side is the seven-branched golden lampstand. In the middle is the altar of incense. Right behind it, there is a curtain that divides the front room and the back room. In front of the curtain is the holy place, and behind the curtain is the most holy place. In the most holy place, there is the Ark of the Covenant. Then what do the holy place and the most holy place represent? What is the reality of these? Let's study this today. John chapter 2, verse 20 reads, The Jews replied, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you are going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. In the Old Testament, it was called sanctuary when it was movable. And when it was built as a building, it was called temple. So the sanctuary and the temple are the same. The temple, the sanctuary, is the body of Jesus. The sanctuary represents Jesus. Let's see Revelation chapter 21, verse 22. I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. God showed Apostle John the temple in heaven. What was the temple in heaven? God taught us that the Lamb is the temple. The temple, in other words, the sanctuary represents the Lamb, Jesus Christ. Let's see Matthew chapter 27, verse 50 through 51. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. How are the death of Jesus and the curtain of the temple related to each other? Here is an important point we must understand. When Jesus died, the curtain of the temple was suddenly torn in two from top to bottom 
and became two pieces. Then, what does the curtain that was torn in two represent in the Bible? What does this scene imply? Let's see Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, here, the Bible specifies a part of the sanctuary which we can enter. What is it? It is the most holy place. To enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, opened for us through the curtain. That is, what? That is His body. Whose body? Jesus' body. The curtain that divided the holy place and the most holy place in the law of the Old Testament represents Jesus, and the sanctuary itself represents Jesus too. There are more things we need to understand about the curtain and the sanctuary. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19 reads, We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. What is there behind the curtain in the sanctuary? It is the most holy place. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where Jesus, who went before us, Jesus went before us. This means we are following Him, right? If there's nobody who follows Him, can the Bible say, He went before us? Jesus went before us. Then what should we do? Shouldn't we enter the inner sanctuary too, after Him? Jesus has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever, in the order of whom? In the order of Melchizedek. Who on earth follows the order of Melchizedek nowadays? Isn't it us? Then, what should we, too, enter? We, too, must enter the inner sanctuary, the most holy place. When you see the structure of the sanctuary, it is made of the holy place and the most holy place. Then what kind of structure does the most holy place have? Let's see how the most holy place looks. 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 14 reads, So Solomon built the temple and completed it. He lined its interior walls with cedar boards paneling them from the floor of the temple to the ceiling, and covered the floor of the temple with planks of pine. He partitioned off 20 cubits at the rear of the temple, with cedar boards from floor to ceiling, to form within the temple an inner sanctuary, the most holy place. The main hall in front of this room was 40 cubits long. The inside of the temple was cedar, carved with gourds and open flowers. Everything was cedar, no stone was to be seen. He prepared the inner sanctuary, that is, the most holy place, within the temple to set the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord there. The inner sanctuary, that is, the most holy place, was 20 cubits long. And how wide and high? 20 wide and 20 high. Solomon's father, David, left his will. Also, God said to David, Solomon, your son, is the one who will build my house and my courts. So following the will, Solomon completed the temple. When the temple was established, the front part of the sanctuary is the holy place, and the back part is the most holy place. In 1 Kings chapter 6, the holy place is called the main hall or the outer room and the Most Holy Place is called the Inner Sanctuary or the Inner Room. The Inner Room was 20 cubits long, 20 wide and 20 high. The size and the structure of the sanctuary are described in 1 Kings chapter 6, 14-20.
How long is the most holy place? 20 cubits. How wide is it? 20 cubits. How high is it? 20 cubits. The length, the width, and the height are all 20 cubits. This is the structure of the most holy place. The length, the width, and the height of the most holy place are all the same. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1 says, The law is only what? Only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. In other words, the holy place and the most holy place that existed in the law of the Old Testament are also a copy and shadow of the reality that is coming. Just a while ago, we read the verses about the sanctuary and its curtain and confirmed that all these represent Jesus. But the most holy place is different. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 7 reads, But only who? Only the high priest entered the inner room, and that only, what? Once a year, and never without blood, which he offered for himself, and for the sins the people had committed in ignorance. The most holy place is not a place that anyone can enter any time. Just as we've seen in the picture, the priest can access the front room of the sanctuary at any time. On the Sabbath day, they change the bread of the presence, and many things are conducted in the sanctuary all the time. But it is not the case with the most holy place. It is a very special place. Only once a year, only the high priest can enter the most holy place. When can he enter? On the Day of Atonement. And never without what? On the Day of Atonement. Never without blood. He never entered the inner room without blood. And this blood was for himself and for the sins the people committed. In other words, on the day when the high priest entered the most holy place, the sins were completely forgiven. Here, we need to know the process of how we are forgiven of our sins. Suppose a man commits a sin on an ordinary day. When he sins, he must receive the wages of the sin. However, God made a law as a copy and shadow and showed us how our sins are transferred. If a man sins, he takes a lamb or a goat to the priest and confesses his sin and transfers the sin to the lamb or the goat. That way, he becomes free from the sin and the burden of the sin is handed over to the lamb or the goat that is to be sacrificed. When we understand this law in the Old Testament, we can understand how our sins are forgiven. Leviticus chapter 16, verse 17 explains this. Leviticus chapter 16, verse 17 reads, No one is to be in the tent of meeting from the time Aaron goes in to make atonement in the most holy place until he comes out, having made atonement for himself, his household, and the whole community of Israel. Only the high priest can enter the most holy place once a year, and only then sins are forgiven completely. Without his entering the most holy place, sins are never removed completely. Before he enters it, sins remain in the sanctuary. Then, on the day when the high priest enters the most holy place, whom does God hand all the sins over to? To the scapegoat. The scapegoat represents Satan. God hands all the sins over to Satan. The high priest lays both hands on the scapegoat's head so that all the sins may return to Satan, the originator of sins. Then the scapegoat is sent away into the desert and dies after wandering. In this way, sins are completely forgiven. This is the regulation in the Old Testament laws. 
So without the Day of Atonement, when the high priest enters the Most Holy Place once a year, the sins of the Israelites cannot be forgiven completely. Then, according to Hebrews chapter 6, who in the order of Melchizedek entered the inner sanctuary behind the curtain? Christ entered the most holy place behind the curtain before us. What about us who are following Him? If we do not enter the most holy place, can we have the complete forgiveness of sins? No, we can't. God tore the curtains so that we can enter the most holy place and receive the perfect forgiveness of sins. God opened the way. Then what if we don't enter the most holy place? What if we don't have faith in the reality of the most holy place? We receive the complete forgiveness of sins? Never ever can we receive the forgiveness of sins. Then whom does the most holy place represent? Who is the reality of the most holy place? We must understand this. The bigger room is the holy place. At the back, the cube-shaped room is the most holy place. The characteristic of the most holy place is that it has the same length, width, and height. This is the very important characteristic. You can find the same description in the vision God showed Apostle John. Let's go to Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21, verse 10. And he carried me away in the Spirit to a mountain great and high, and showed me, what? Showed him the holy city. What's the name of it? Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. How does the holy city Jerusalem look? What kind of structure does it have? Verse 14, The wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. The angel who talked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city, its gates, and its walls. The city was laid out like a square, as long as it was wide. He measured the city with the rod and found it to be twelve thousand stadia in length, and what? As wide and high as it is long. Moses built the sanctuary on the earth as God had shown him on Mount Sinai. The book of Revelation says that Jerusalem is as wide and high as it is long. If then, what relationship is there between Jerusalem and the Most Holy Place? They have the relationship between a copy and its reality. The width is 12,000 stadia, the length is 12,000 stadia, and the height is 12,000 stadia. The city, which is as wide and high as it is long, is coming down out of heaven. This city is named Jerusalem. In the past, when God showed Moses the temple of heaven, Moses could see a part of the heavenly sanctuary as it is described here. Then which part of the sanctuary is the city of the New Jerusalem? It is certainly the most holy place. What is the reality of the New Jerusalem then? We've understood that Jerusalem is the reality of the most holy place, which is as wide and high as it is long. Now, let us find what the city of the New Jerusalem stands for. Galatians chapter 4, verse 26. But the Jerusalem that is above is free, and she is who? She is our mother. We can understand that a profound meaning is contained in Jerusalem. Ultimately, God wanted us to know the existence of mother. The holy place refers to father. And whom does the most holy place refer to? It refers to mother. It is written, the curtain separating the most holy place from the holy place is the body of Christ. As the curtain was torn in two, which part of the temple was revealed? The most holy place, right? 
According to Romans chapter 5, whom does Adam represent? Adam represents Christ. Jesus' side was pierced and his rib was taken out. By this, who appeared? Eve appeared. Since the curtain of the temple is Christ's body, as Christ's body, which was represented as Adam's body, was torn, Eve, who is in him, appeared. Who is Eve? Heavenly Mother, the mother of all the living, appeared. It is also written that Christ went before us into the inner sanctuary that is behind the curtain. As He went before us, we too must enter the most holy place. In other words, we must receive our mother and believe in her. Our faith must not end in the holy place. It must continue to which place? Our faith must continue to the inner sanctuary, the most holy place. When we do that, all the sins we committed in heaven can be forgiven completely. We can receive the perfect forgiveness of sins. That's why we must have our father and mother as well. In the religious world, where God the Mother does not exist, the mediator who can pass our sins to Satan is disconnected from us. The high priest must enter the most holy place so that all our sins can be forgiven completely. If we do not go into the most holy place, if we do not receive Heavenly Mother, there cannot be the perfect forgiveness of sins. That's why the Day of Atonement was needed. And there was a ceremony of the Law of the Old Testament through which we could enter the Most Holy Place. God established this profound truth in the systems of the laws. Isn't it amazing? Who is the Jerusalem that is as wide and high as it is long? Galatians chapter 4 verse 26 says that Jerusalem that is above, the heavenly Jerusalem that has the same length, width, and height, is free, and she is who? She is our mother. Yes, she is our mother. We are truly happy. We are forgiven not only with words, you are forgiven, you receive the forgiveness of sins, but also with convincing proof. What is more, that is not the temporary forgiveness of sins, but the perfect forgiveness. How amazing! In order to let us know this, God commanded to build what are copies of heavenly things on the earth. And for about 1,500 years, in the Old Testament times, through the holy place and the most holy place built on the earth. And for about 2,000 years, from the days of Jesus till now in the New Testament times, God has taught this to mankind. Despite that, do people know God the Mother? Do they know the most holy place? The holy place and the most holy place without knowing why such laws were needed in the ceremonies of the Old Testament and what they mean, people just utter the forgiveness of sins vaguely. The way to receive the forgiveness of sins is never vague. Then, what is the role of the Most Holy Place in the law? Let us think about it once again. On ordinary days, people's sins are moved onto the temple temporarily until the Day of Atonement. And the perfect forgiveness of sins is done on the Day of Atonement, when the High Priest enters the Most Holy Place. Then, just because it is the Day of Atonement, are the sins forgiven? No. On the Day of Atonement, there are certain ceremonies. There are certain procedure and ceremonies to enter the Most Holy Place. That's why Jesus entered the inner sanctuary behind the curtain in the order of Melchizedek. He meant, I go into the inner sanctuary before you. You too, follow me to the place. The book of Hebrews chapter 6 emphasizes that point. Why is it that the law of the old covenant that passed by is mentioned again in the new covenant times? The truth our father and mother have given us is truly marvelous, mysterious, 
and precious. Although staying in this amazing truth, if we do not give thanks and rejoice, but lose confidence and hope for heaven, or waver like reeds, it is a great sin before God. God has granted us this clear and definite proof. Through all this process, we must believe in Heavenly Mother, who is the reality of the Most Holy Place. Unless we have faith in Heavenly Mother, we cannot say, I receive the forgiveness of sins completely. I can enter the kingdom of heaven. If we boast like this, it will be nothing but vain confidence and vague words. Without Heavenly Mother, we can never be forgiven of sins. We can never be connected with the forgiveness of sins. So, in order to receive the perfect forgiveness of sins, we must believe in Heavenly Mother, the reality of the Most Holy Place. Only then can we enter the perfect forgiveness of sins. This is the teaching of Heavenly Father. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain. If we open the curtain and go through it, there is only the most holy place. It enters the inner sanctuary, where Jesus, who went before us, He went before us, has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. If He doesn't need to enter it, if people's sins, which had been piled up in the sanctuary on ordinary days, could be forgiven completely, why did He enter the Most Holy Place on the Day of Atonement? Why do you think God made this law? God wants us to fully understand the reality of the Most Holy Place. Concerning the structure of the Most Holy Place, it is written, that it is as wide and high as it is long. And the city of heavenly Jerusalem, too, is as wide and high as it is long. According to the pattern of the heavenly sanctuary, the earthly one was made. In conclusion, if we do not go to the heavenly Jerusalem Mother, who is the most holy place, we can never receive the perfect forgiveness of sins. Father Han wrote in his notebook as follows. Elisha follows Elijah, Joshua follows Moses, Peter follows Jesus, and I follow Mother. Why did Father write that? Aren't you curious about this? Who entered the Most Holy Place? Christ went into the Most Holy Place before us. Then. We must follow Him into it. That's why Father Han wrote in his notebook, I follow Mother. Heavenly Father, Christ An Sang Hong, who is the High Priest as the reality of Melchizedek, entered the Most Holy Place. As we should follow Him, he went before us. Therefore, we too must enter it. The most holy place is the place we must enter and the last destination of our faith. Now let's look at Revelation chapter 22, verse 17. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. Come to the most holy place. In order to enter the Most Holy Place, what place should we go through? We must go through the Holy Place. Without passing through the Outer Sanctuary, the Holy Place, no one can enter the Inner Sanctuary, the Most Holy Place. There is another process. In order for the High Priest to enter the Most Holy Place, he must wash his hands and feet with water from the basin before entering the Holy Place. When he passes through the Holy Place, he can see the Most Holy Place. Heavenly Father and Mother, the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. In other words, the Holy Place and the Most Holy Place say, Come, for the perfect forgiveness of sins.
as we committed sins in heaven and came to the earth, what we can do on the earth is only to repent of our sins. The grace of the forgiveness of sins is the greatest blessing among the blessings of God. The last place of blessing is the most holy place. God says, if you have realized it, come to me, come. But the evil spirits tell lies. They create malicious rumors and spread them among people. They say, you must never go to the church of God. That is Satan's scheme to prevent people from receiving the forgiveness of sins. The kingdom of heaven is getting very near. I earnestly hope that none of us will become foolish children who lose the kingdom of heaven or miss it. At the end of our journey, we see Mother. It was a long journey from the sanctuary in the days of Moses to the sanctuary of the heavenly Jerusalem. At the end of the journey, there is our Mother. Aren't you happy? I am so happy. Be joyful always. Give thanks in all circumstances. Pray continually. Let us once again engrave these words deep in our hearts and give eternal glory and praise to God Elohim for allowing us to know this gracious truth. Father and Mother, thank you. We will follow you to the end wherever you go. Having this faith, let us complete the mission to preach to 7 billion people this year. Thank you very much. God bless you.